Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today Show. And today our topic matter is pre and post for surgery. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about foods, supplements, procedural things that you need to try and accomplish before surgery, pre-surgery, and what you can do post-surgery in order to speed up your recovery. So when we're talking about surgery, always be aware, and I oftentimes the doctors just tell you to go off of all of your supplements before surgery, and I wanted to give you a list of things that you needed to make sure that you were off of. First of all, you want to avoid vitamin E, aspirin, ginkgo biloba, ginger, kava kava, and EPA at least one week before surgery. The reason why is these are blood thinners, and of course if you are on any Coumadin or any other types of blood thinners as well, you want to make sure under your doctor's supervision that you go off of these blood thinners. The reason why is when they cut into you, obviously, you will bleed more. So something else, and a lot of times it's not very well discussed, but it is discussed a lot among plastic surgeons, and that's quitting smoking before you have surgery, especially if it's major surgery or plastic surgery. Oftentimes, surgeons will not do a surgery at least not the beauty surgeries, if you're smoking. The reason why is every cigarette that you smoke destroys 25 to 50 milligrams of vitamin C, which is very important for the collagen matrix, and there's tons of chemicals that the liver has to process. Bottom line, cigarette smoking blocks healing. So if you can quit smoking, at least even if it's temporary, before and for a while after uh, your surgery, it can really speed up the healing, particularly if you're talking about plastic surgeries. Um, considerations before you have surgery. And, and I think these, some of these things, and I may not have them in the order I'm going to review through, but you need to really quiz your doctor and find out if this is really, really a procedure that needs to be done. I have seen more unnecessary gallbladder surgeries, unnecessary, you know, full replacements of this, wiping out of that without any alternatives being attempted or discussed. Full knee replacements, when partial knee replacements might work, gallbladder stones, they can be cut out or removed or there are gallbladder flushes versus removing the entire uh, gallbladder, things like that. So you really need to discuss with your doctor, first of all, if this surgery is, if there's any alternatives, you know, what is the recovery time on this? You know, what are the possible um, problems that can occur with it? I know we've seen, gosh, tons of commercials on bladder surgery mesh that are leaving people to where they're damaged and injured, uh, causing cancer, inflammatory response, um, and they're worse than when they ever had, had the surgery. So these discussions need to be uh, made, and you need to make yourself a checklist of any questions that you might have for the doctor how long I'm going to be in the hospital, recovery, are you going to give me any physical therapy, um, and then of course discussions about any medications, and that's on this as well. You've got to review with your doc any allergies, medications, uh, any, anything that you're on, period. The reason being is, is oftentimes the surgeons do not have a copy of your records to know what medications and all you're on, and neither does the anesthesiologist that may be putting you under. So it's really, really important that you, re, you know, let them know all your food, drug, and chemical allergies. Like, I'm allergic to eggs. You turn around while I'm recovering and you give me a vaccine, I'm going to allergically, anaphylactically um, react, and you can kill me. So it's very, very important that you review this uh, with your doctor. Another consideration, particularly for major surgeries, is considering storing your own blood. Now, I know our blood supply is clean, and I'm not trying to say uh, anything, but, but, once again, I'm allergic to eggs and peanuts, and I'm anaphylactic for shrimp. It has now been shown that if I would receive blood from a donor that had these or eaten these the night before and it's in his bloodstream, him or her, his or her bloodstream, I could have an anaphylactic attack and they would never know the reason why I died. 
So if you have an opportunity before a major surgery to store your own blood, you know, like a knee replacement or that type of thing, where you expect you might possibly need the blood, have your blood, donate your own blood, have them keep it on hand for your surgery. I think it's a lot, uh, something that a lot of people don't think about. A procedural thing that we need to keep in mind is a lot of surgeries involve shaving the small hair and all either on the face, you know, the tummy, that type of thing. And what the studies have shown is that shaving the night before versus shaving the morning of the surgery actually increase the risk of infection. So make sure that if you are having to shave an area where there's hair for the incision, make sure you shave the morning right before the surgery especially anything having to do with the abdominal or the facial areas. You know, oftentimes, once we get done with surgery because of the anesthesia and all, um, we'll have constipation and, you know, tummy issues. What I suggest before you ever go into surgery is maybe down a couple of servings of aloe vera, get your fiber up and magnesium, and cling out your bell get things moving, get things rolling, because number one, you'll detox before surgery so that when the chemicals do hit your body from the anesthesia and all, you'll be re better ready to handle any potential constipation they may cause because you will have already been cleaned out. And aloe vera is very anti-inflammatory, very safe to take, soothes the bowel, and can also help with any kind of that nausea feeling that a lot of people get after they have the anesthesia. It can kind of settle down the stomach in that regard as well, too. Avoid all, and I, I put this very much down, all inflammatory foods. Now, the nightshades are the biggest classifications of foods, and that includes tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, peppers, tomatillos, but any, any type of inflammatory histamine rising like strawberries, um, you know, alcohol, any of those kinds of things that can tend to may or be anti-inflammatory on you. And by all means, please avoid foods that you know you have sensitivities to. Now, these nightshade vegetables do not allow you to get rid of inflammation. They um, produce a, a chemical that doesn't cause inflammation, but it just doesn't allow the body to deflame. So if you can avoid them before surgery, it would be very helpful. Diet. Now, I know we don't talk much about diet when, when you think about having surgery, but seriously, if you have some notice about surgery, clean things up. You know, get rid of the alcohol as much as best as you can. Um, alkali the diet, lots of greens, organic fruits and vegetables, uh, a lot of alkali producing vegetables, of course, um, not eating or avoiding the nightshade veggies. Potassium rich foods. Now, I mentioned earlier about taking magnesium. Magnesium and potassium are electrolytes that can often be, uh, be lost during surgery. So I would really encourage that you look up a list or you can come to the store, uh, vitamin herb stores, and get a list of the potassium-rich foods, or you can go look online. But include those in your diet and get, get the list of that, those alkali foods. If you do those before and after surgery, you're going to heal much, much quicker. I want to review with you some supplements that can be very helpful before surgery. And you know, it's kind of funny, um, I, a good portion um, of doctors out there that do hmm, cosmetic surgery know about these, but the rest of the surgeons don't ever recommend them. And they're very, very, very helpful to take before surgery. And the list is, as included, Make sure you get your vitamin C, particularly a buffered or an ester C, 1,000 milligrams twice a day. Don't take it at the same time as your Bs. Uh, so it may be one at lunch, one at dinner. It helps build the collagen matrix in your skin that allows your body to heal. Um, I had a customer come in today, and she just was not healing. And so immediately I made sure her C was up. And also vitamin D to aid in uh, skin healing. Um, there is specifically an Arnica Montana made by a company called Boron, and I don't usually recommend name brands, but in this case I do because it's a 30C. And you want to take four, pell four pellets, um, don't touch them with your hands, they go directly in your mouth three times a day, two days before surgery. 
Now what that's going to do is it's going to help reduce the inflammation, but it's also going to prevent some of the bruising that goes along with surgeries, particularly around the uh, areas surrounding the bruising. Make sure you're taking a good multiple vitamin with lots of nutrients. The B's and C's help your skin tissue repair and it's great to get you prepared physiologically, nutrient-wise, for the surgery. Um, colloidal silver or oregano oil. Now, you know, before I uh, go to the dentist and I ever have a tooth pulled or anything like that, I always um, take a swig of colloidal silver because it's an antimicrobial and it kills viral, fungal, and bacterial infections. You can do the same type of thing before you go to surgery. Um, you can take colloidal silver internally and it does not interfere with any medications. And then oregano oil. These both have an affinity for killing off staph infections. Very, very effective against antibiotic resistant infections. So oregano oil, and I had one of my customers recently go in for a knee replacement and was taking a low dose oregano oil in order to prevent any potential staph infection. Because believe it or not, the customer I had today that wasn't healing, she ended up with a staph infection. The doctor had to go back in and cut stuff out and then she still wasn't healing. So very prevalent among hospitals. It just has to do with cleanliness. And you know, this happened at one of our Santa Barbara hospitals. So it is what it is. Probiotics, the good bacteria. You know, nine times out of 10, you're going to go on an antibiotic when you are in the hospital admitted for surgery or teeth uh, or gum surgeries. These probiotics um, are responsible for 80% minimum of your immune system. And what they are is they're little good bacteria that build up in the bowel um, along the intestines and in the colon and help your immune system. Well, they help you break down food, help with uh, some depression uh, by helping with your serotonin uh, production. But they help your body fight off staph and other infections as well. Now, post-op, you want to continue to do that Arnica Montana um, for at least five days post-op, once again under the tongue. Keeping the vitamin C and the good multi up to help the collagen matrix repair. And then we add in something kind of interesting that um, really, really helps eat scar tissue. Now I know oftentimes post-op, you know, a surgeon's not going to really think too much about scar tissue, but if you're having any type of breast augmentations, facial surgeries, or the big old cut across the gut, or heart surgeries, Bromelain can help eat scar tissue. Knee replacement surgeries, we also use bromelain to eat scar tissue, but there's another aspect about bromelain. It eats blood clots or it prevents blood clots from happening, so it prevents the fibrin that can form and, and jumble together and cause blood clots. Bromelain eats those and helps eat, eats fibrin, so it lessens the chance that you're gonna form uh, especially the keloid types of scarring that can occur with a major surgery. Vitamin E post-op. Now, remember how I told you before, a week before your surgery, you want to get off of all vitamin E. But post-surgery, um, taking a vitamin E 400 to 800 does increase oxygenation and enables wounds to heal. Once your uh, wound is healed, or once you know the stitches are out or the surrey stitches are out, you can utilize the vitamin E to go on the top of the wound to help with scarring. Uh, and once again, internally taken to help with oxygenation, to help the wound heal, topical application to help with scarring. There's also a wonderful wound cream I wish a lot of physicians would look at, and it's made by a company called Nutribiotic. And it's a combination of grapefruit seed extract, ACE, but it's one of the best antimicrobials, and it's extremely, extremely anti-staph, aids the healing, and topical application of that post-op can be very helpful as well, too. Some other things to increase oxygenation and help the healing of wounds, CoQ10. Now, I know you think, we think of CoQ10 as being for the heart and for the brain and for COPD, like I, I discussed on our last show. But CoQ10, on a cellular level, helps the body oxygenate. Now, we know from hyperbaric chambers when, when burn victims go in or people who have bed sores go into hyperbaric chambers, which is oxygenating, the wounds heal very, very quick. If you have a wound that does not heal, ask your doctor about hyperbaric chambers 
or going in there at least a couple of times a week to speed the healing of a wound. Particularly if you're a diabetic. This is a huge issue among diabetics and that's why this supplementation, eating scar tissue and all, and reducing inflammation is so important among um, all, all wound, people's, people that want to heal wounds, but particularly among diabetics. Green tea. Now, I know we think of green tea as being a great fat burner, an antioxidant, but it also helps prevent some of the platelet aggregation and it helps wounds heal, believe it or not, internally. Besides lengthening your life, you know, if you drink three to five cups a day, it can really aid and abed the healing of wounds. Milk thistle and inacetylcysteine. I put those on there because oftentimes post-op, you're going to have an issue with detoxification of anesthesia as well as uh, the, the, um, the medications that are utilized for pain, which can cause a lot of constipation. These help the liver detoxify um, some of these uh, medications in low dosages. Um, we do them to help the liver de better deal with it. And then adding in maybe a little bit of magnesium and essential fatty acids to help the bowel movement in addition with fiber and aloe vera can be very helpful if you get constipation post-op. Topical application, once again, vitamin E oil, or there's, there are scar gels that you can get out there as well that come from extract of onions that can aid and abed the healing. There are a lot of other things I could mention, other herbs, other things that help, but these are the bottom line, the most safe and effective procedures to follow in preparation and recovery for surgery. And you can come to the vitamin and herb stores and get a copy of this uh, as well. Uh, and I'll be happy to share it with any physicians that might like a copy. Next, we're gonna be moving on to the fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And today I'm gonna to go over a couple of exercises that can help a little bit with tummy discomfort. And there's just three of them I'm gonna show you and they're really basic and easy and don't wanna overcomplicate anything. Bring your knees up and hold them probably for about 30 seconds on each side, okay? And then bring them up together and hopefully too, maybe you may pass a little gas, but it can help relieve some of the pressure and then roll it, roll back on your back, back and forth, side to side. Believe it or not, that helps stimulate some of the digestive juices and gets things moving. And then finally, leg straight out, bring your other leg over and just kind of lay on the side. You're supported on each side with your hands sticking out. And then alternate over onto the other side in the other direction as well too. And what that's doing is that's twisting and pulling on the stomach, the intestines, and the liver gallbladder area, especially when you bring the knees up. And hopefully that will help some of the tummy discomfort. Thank you very much. Next, we're gonna be moving on to the research portion of our show. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show, and with us today is Ralph Turciano. And thank you for that intro. Today we have three articles and possibly one bonus article if we have time. The first article is going to be chewing gum can make you fat. Second article is why you may hate working out in the gym. And the third article is now known as the Monsanto Protection Act, signed by one of our industrious, illustrious leaders, not industrious, otherwise he'd be working. All right, outside of that, we have three articles. First one coming up is chewing gum can make you fat. Guess why? Well, let's back up. This was done at Ohio State University, and what they did is they basically wanted to see people's appetites in regards to chewing gum. Interesting enough is you do eat less meals chewing gum. But, however, you eat more calories. Why is that? Well, it's a chemical in chewing gum called methanol. Methanol has an interesting effect when combining with fruits and vegetables. It makes them taste bitter, meaning you're not going to want to eat fruits and vegetables, but you're going to crave sweet foods instead. And this is what it comes down to. Scientists have discovered that people who chew gum eat more cal high-calorie sweet foods. 
because what is responsible for the minty flavor, as we discussed, menthol, makes savory foods, especially fruits and vegetables, taste unpleasant. So something to think about when giving your kids gum is basically if you're trying to get them to eat the fruits and vegetables, they're not going to want to do it. And even if you give them fruit flavored gum, they found out, even though not as conclusive, that the fruit flavored gum made them not want to eat fruit, contrary to belief. They also said the chemical change is the same reason why you brush your teeth and you drink orange juice, it tastes bad. Scientists discovered that people who chew gum do eat more high calorie sweet foods, because it's the only thing left that tastes good. Those who have been eating fruit flavored gum, again, as we said, lost interest in eating fruits. The researchers also discovered that people who chew gum do tend to eat fewer meals, as we stated before, but that did not translate into fewer calories because they were craving more of those sweet foods. So something to think about. We normally think about gum being good for dieting because we offset it by chewing. No. If food manufacturers know this, they would love to throw a little bit of mint in before your, diet, your dinner. This way you're eating more sugars and sweets. All right, outside of that, do you hate working out at the gym? You're not lazy. It's genetic, scientists claim. Well, I can't wait for that excuse. Yeah, honey, I'm not going to go to the gym today because genetically I'm just not ready for it. All right, so as we begin to devolve our population, this is what they say. 50% of why you want to go to a gym or not is determined by your genetics. Why is because, in their words, while some people experience euphoria from endorphins after exercise, others will find the mood plummet through their psychobiological inner voice, scientists claim. Your genetics screaming at you saying, oh, this is not good. All right, and this was also done at Iowa State University. They found that people's tolerance to pain factors caused by exercise could be up to 50% genetic. So when playing your slave race, look for those genes which make them endure pain because I guess they'll want to work more. Why? Well, besides athletes being referred to in this article as benign masochists, they discovered, it is below this way, that some people's physical capacity is much lower than they even realize. So even low impact tasks like cooking dinner could be enough to tire you out. Can you imagine that? Now, that doesn't sound genetically right, but could you be so genetically inclined that even trying to make food to eat is a tiring experience? I mean, we're not talking Iron Chef or anything like that. We're just talking preparing a sandwich. So that's something to think about. And as they stated too, as people approach their maximum capacity, negative reaction is unavoidable. Most people, 60% of the maximum capacity would be enough for them to tire out. But however, in the genetic range for an elite athlete, elite athlete, it'd be 80% of their, of their maximum capacity before they tire out. For the average sedentary individual, that barrier is 35%. So yes, going to make a sandwich, going to grab your own glass of water, um, washing your car, throwing laundry in the wash machine, uh, throwing dishes in the dishwasher, by some odd means, can actually blow your aerobic capacity or genetic capacity to work out. So can't wait till your teenager pulls that excuse on you. Mom, dad, it's just out of my genetics. <laughs> All right, outside of that, one other one that came out, and this was very, this hit the wave as far as the blogs and the internet recently, but it did not make your daily news. The Obama signs the Monsanto Protection Act, written by Monsanto's sponsored senator. And this has nothing to do with Democrat or Republican, because obviously the bill was written by a Republican senator that basically got a lot of campaign contributions from Monsanto. But again, the Obama administration has appointed Monsanto executives to very high positions all throughout government, from the FDA to the US Department of Agriculture. Uh, so it's basically a joint effort. Well, what am I talking about primarily? It's Bill H.R. 933. Well, if this bill passed, they discovered 78 pages into the bill was something called, based, no, not something called, but was referred to as the Monsanto Protection Act. Now think about this. This is a conspiracy theorist dream. First thing that happens in California, 
the laws get shot down preventing you from labeling what's GMO. Now this bill passes, H.R. 933, and 78 pages hidden in the bill is an act which does this. Basically, it's what it does, it gives the Monsanto and any other GMO crop a one-year waiver where there's absolutely no legal recourse when they go to plant a crop. Whether it harms people or not, you never have to know. Meaning if that genetically modified crop, for example, kills butterflies, bees, um, doesn't make a difference. You have no legal recourse. And here it goes. Basically, the Obama bill ignored the petition. 250,000 people signed the petition to get him to stop this. And asking the president to veto the spending bill over this biotech rider. But Obama ignored it. Instead of choosing to sign a bill that effectively bars federal courts from being able to halt the sale or planting of GMO or GE crops and seeds no matter what the health consequences from the consumption of these products may come to light in the future. The U.S. Department of Agriculture all of a saw and approved or denied the testing of genetically modified seeds while the federal courts retained the authority to halt the testing or sale of these plants if it felt that the public was being jeopardized. Now with H.R. 933, where the federal courts come in to help protect you, guess what? The court system no longer has the right to step in and protect the consumer. That's why it's called the Monsanto Protection Rider. And basically it goes on as far as this. One year is what they have. It all takes to cause what's called catastrophic damage to the environment by allowing laboratory produced organisms to be planted into the earth without oversight. Without oversight. Under the Monsanto Protection Act, health concerns that arise in the immediate future involving these planting or GMO crops won't be able to be heard by a judge. Meaning they, once they release Pan or open Pandora's box, they cannot close it. What does this mean? Well, obviously it means that genetic uh, testing is not going to take place the same scrutiny that it used to. Why? Because now we can do whatever we want to. We don't have to even label it genetically modified. It could be, uh, let's say, for example, what happened with uh, starling corn. Remember that? What occurred is a corn species got uh, put in the distribution route by accident through the grain silos, ended up being in Taco Bell, and generally a lot of the individuals ended up getting anaphylactic shock because the peanut protein that was found in the corn that was not meant for human consumption entered the system. Well, obviously, in this case, under HR 933, there is no legal recourse. They can continue to sell it for a year, even if it's harming, damaging, or destroying the environment. And that is a freedom which should never be given to a major multi-billion dollar corporation. Yeah. Unfortunately, my time is up, and I'm finishing this. And research HR 933, please be blown away. Thank you very much. You would think governments would seek to protect their people. Do your research. Any help we can give you, you can contact us at the vitamin and herb stores. Thank you very much.